today we're going to be learning about what it's like to be an archaeologist. Uh, so while we're waiting for everyone to get here, if you want to put in the chat, um, what do you guys think archaeologists do? And maybe what comes to mind when you hear the word archaeology? Somebody said Indiana Jones. It's a good one. That's how I first learned about archaeology. Somebody said artifacts. Somebody else said uncovering ancient artifacts and buildings. Yes. And also while we're waiting, if you want to make sure you have a uh, paper and a pencil or a pen, because we're going to do an activity at the beginning and an activity at the end. So my name is Charlie, and I'm a student at the university, and I'm helping run programs here at the OI this summer. Hi, everyone. I'm Calgary. I'm the Youth and Family Program Manager at the OI. And then we're also joined today by Sasha. Okay, journey to Egypt. Egypt. So for our activity to start, um, we're going to... Uh, have, hopefully you have a pencil and a paper or some coloring markers or crayons and we're going to do uh, draw what you think an archaeologist looks like. So there's a picture of an archaeologist right here. Um, so maybe th things to think about is like, what are they doing? Uh, I'm going to have, I'm going to be drawing a lawn. I think I'll draw mine digging. Somebody mentioned that in the chat. That's something an archaeologist does. Um, also, like what tools they might be using. So in this picture, somebody's using a little brush. So maybe I'll give my archaeologist a little brush and maybe like a shovel. Somebody in the chat said jackhammer. I don't know. Well, <laughs> that seems pretty extreme for a dig site. We'll see about that. <laughs> but there's a cool idea. Maybe I'll add a shovel. And then where would you find them? So where, where would an archaeologist be in the world? Or out in the field? Maybe they're in a library. Maybe they're just hanging around, around a museum. Those are all good places to find archaeologists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so hopefully um, you can keep drawing while we go through the rest of the presentation. But right now, we're going to hear from Sasha, who's a real archaeologist, about um, what she does and what her life is like in the, uh, in the business. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, hello. First off, my name is Sasha Rarit. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. I'm studying Egyptian archaeology. I've been excavating uh, for about 10 years. I've been going on, on digs in various places, Massachusetts, right here in the States, um, Cyprus, a little island in the military Mediterranean, and, and it sites in both Upper and Lower Egypt. Uh, I love animals, both ancient and modern, as you can see here in this picture. Um, which is probably why I focus on zooarchaeology, which basically just means that I study animal bones kind of that are in the archaeological record. So I'll talk a little more about what I specialize in later. But for now, let's go ahead and talk about going on excavation. So what does it mean when we say we're going to go on an excavation or we're going to go on a dig? So you can either chat, you know, Charlie or myself or just put it to the, you know, the everyone. Just give me your ideas. What do you think it means when we say we're going to go on an excavation? Somebody said exploring, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, we can go exploring. I know probably applies from the last one, but when people say dig, yeah. Does Trina have a question? Do you want to unmute Trina? Um, actually, I hmm? forgot. Okay, no that's worries. Okay. If you remember it, just go ahead and put it in the chat. And we'll see it there. Um, someone else said to uncover artifacts that are thought to be there. Yeah, for sure. You might think that we know that there's something hiding underneath the ground. And so we do lots of different tests to see if there are things under the ground. That's definitely true. We don't want to just start digging willy nilly and dig a big hole and be like, oh, well, there's nothing here. Kind of a waste of time and money. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll talk about some ways. Oh, Trina, you got your hand raised again. Oh, sorry. I got to put that down. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> all right, well, it's okay. If you're not entirely sure what that means, it's all right, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, did Ryan have a question really quick, though, Sasha? Oh, yeah, Ryan. Um, I, I, it wasn't a question. I was just thinking maybe, well, I, I know, like, Kent, Kelly, and T.L., I can't pronounce it again. I forgot. But the people who, like, dig for dinosaurs and stuff, yeah, they, so paleontologists. Uh, I mean, they use like brushes, as we saw. Um, mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, that's right. So there's actually a lot of um, similarities between what the tools that archaeologists and paleontologists, which are people who study dinosaurs, um, or just kind of past animal life, so life, are paleontologists. So we have a lot of similar items that we use when we're doing excavations. That's exactly right. Okay, it, so oh, like one more, it would be like a sifter because I think they use sifters to sift. Yeah, out, like treasure. Exactly. Things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you'll pour a whole bucket of dirt and other things into one of these sifters, and you shake it back and forth until all the dirt falls through, and then hopefully you find cool things that are left over. A lot of times, though, you just find rocks, and that's a lot less exciting. But anyway. Huh, yeah. <laughs> all right. So going on excavation. Let's see if this PowerPoint feels like working. All right, so the first thing you might hear is an excavation season. So what is a season? We know there are four seasons in the year, right? We got spring, summer, autumn, winter. That's great, but that's not always what excavation season refers to. The excavation season or the dig season, as it's sometimes called, just refers to how long we spend in the field. So time-wise, the season can be anywhere from like two weeks to many, many months, depending on the dig that you're on and what your goals are uh, for your time at the site. So if you're doing a survey, which just means kind of like looking at an area and trying to decide like if you think there's something there and if it's worth doing a full excavation and digging things up, you may only need a couple of weeks, right? But if you're excavating the ground, you gotta pull a bunch of stuff out. It just takes a lot more time. And so in that case, you'll need like at least a month, ideally more. So the excavations that I've been on have been anywhere from like six weeks to three months long. And then some other people have been on digs that are like, six months long if they're able to stay in the country that long so it just really depends and sometimes you'll go just once a year for a couple months and you'll come back and then do a lot of the like research work after or you might go there for a few months and then come back for a few months and then go there for a few months it just really depends on who's running the excavation and what time they have to actually be in the field so it varies a lot but basically when someone says an excavation season or a dig season they're just talking about the time that they're spending in the field of doing whatever it is that they've decided to do that year. The next thing you might hear is something called a specialty. And that just means what a person is focusing on. So that can be animal bones like me. So my specialty is zooarchaeology. Um, it could be human bones you're focusing on or pottery, also known as ceramics, uh, from different time periods or traditions. Uh, you can look at architecture or maybe your specialty is language. There's all kinds of it kinds of different specialties. So honestly, as many people as there are in the world, there's probably a similar number of specialties depending on how focused they get. They might focus on this one very particular thing, right? So we'll talk more about those a little bit later on when we talk to some of my friends who also do archeology. span Lastly, we have the dig house. And that kind of just refers to where archeologists go back to at the end of the day. So speaking of which, you might be wondering, where do archeologists sleep? We just like out on the ground somewhere? Maybe, maybe not. No, usually we're not just like on the ground. But uh, if you're wondering where we sleep, there are a wide range of answers to that too. So at Tel Edfu, we're lucky enough to have funding that lets us stay at this beautiful little hotel. Um, it's called the Funduk Al Shams, which is Arabic for the Sun Hotel or Hotel of the Sun. It's very nice and definitely like the nicest place that I've ever stayed when we we're on excavation. We have like rooms that sometimes we end up sharing if we have a lot of people who are on our excavation, but most of the time you can get your own room and it's got this nice little space outside. It's very pretty, um, but that's not what most people get. Oftentimes you might be living in tents like this, or you might be living in, you know, just like tents you go camping in. And that could be, again, you might be living in a tent for like six weeks to a few months. Um, the main archaeologist, or one of the two main archaeologists on my excavation at Tel Edfu, he works at a place on the Red Sea, and they'll literally be there for like six weeks just like living in tents like this, and you get like one bucket of water that you have to use for anything you need to wash throughout the day. So you probably want to make sure to like brush your teeth before you take a shower with it, otherwise you might get some white grubby things on your teeth. Don't want that. <laughs> so lots of different things. Some digs don't have running water or electricity at all. Definitely possibly just have like lamp lights. Um, but yeah, so which dig house would you prefer? <laughs> I think I, I have my answer. <laughs> and Sasha, did, um, did Vikram have a question really quick? Yes. Vikram. Awesome, ask away. Um, so um, what, is there an excavation season? Like a main excavation season? So it just, not really. Um, it just kind of depends 
on who's running it. So I tend to go um, when our dig is, is like in the fall. So it might be in like September, October, November timeframe, but other places they'll dig in the summer. Some places want to dig in the winter because you know it's going to be a lot cooler in the winter than it will be in the summer. Like trying to dig in Egypt in the summer is just blisteringly hot. It gets up to like 110 degrees multiple days in a row. And that's no fun to try to dig in that. So we try to avoid digging in Egypt in like the height of summer. So it just depends on the place. So there's no specific time. Oh, thing. No problem. See, there are a couple other hands raised. Or is that just coming to me? Yeah, Emma, did you want to unmute? Uh-huh. So, um, question is that couldn't they just get another bucket of water? Well, sometimes it's like, they have to go really far to get the water. So they only get like one bucket a day because it takes so much effort to like get the bucket of water from really far away and then bring it back. So they just were like, all right, you get your one bucket. It's like a pretty big bucket, but even so, probably not the most fun. Yeah, right? there's another question I had. Mm -hmm. um, there's like this little cart in the front of the screen. Mm -hmm. um, the front... Um, yeah, I'm talking about that. I want to know that what that is. That's a really great question. I'm not entirely sure what that is. It looks like it might have stuff inside, so it might be some kind of uh, like sieve or like the thing that you can you know shake and then get all the dirt out. It also might just be something that they have outside to cart things around. I'm not entirely sure in this picture. Yeah, but it looks like it has wheels. Yeah, it does look like it has wheels. Maybe it's just used to transport stuff around the camp, make it a little easier than trying to carry it around. Maybe to carry the basket, maybe to carry the bucket of water. Possibly, yeah, if you don't want to carry it like this. Probably be pretty heavy. Yeah, good idea. Moving All right, so it on now, wheels is easier. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I also see some people said they prefer the hotel. I agree, I also prefer the hotel. <laughs> okay, so now that we know what a dig is and how long they're there and where we sleep, what do you pack? What do you pack? What do you think you pack when you were going on excavation? Go ahead and put it in the chat to me or to Charlie. Sunscreen. Yes, that is very important, especially in Egypt. <laughs> yeah, some tools. We'll talk about the kinds of tools we want to take with us. Definitely that brush that Charlie talked about. I think someone said anti-venom. We do, I think, have a little like snake bite kit, but luckily it doesn't come up too often that we have like snakes. Scorpions are around a little bit more, but they don't also want to hang out. So you kind of like lift up a rock and one's there. They just kind of scutter away. Water, yes, lots of water. Bug spray is great. Yeah, the mosquitoes can be really bad sometimes. Um, water and food, luckily we can get that in country. So we don't have to worry about like carting water and food from the United States over to Egypt to get that. Honestly, Egyptian food is really yummy too. First aid, yeah, definitely some good things. All right, cool. So let's, these are not, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just some things that I thought about where we're going. Yeah, brush, notepad, water, sunblocks, shovels, tools. Oh, all great guys. So first off, you're gonna need the right clothes, right? So like I said, it can get up to like 110 degrees in Egypt easily in the summer, um, like many days in a row. So this top picture is really funny because my friend ended up sweating into the shape of a heart because he was so sweaty. So they'll tell me he made a heart shape of sweat, which I thought was hilarious. Um, and then all the times it can get really cold in Egypt. So if we're there in the winter instead of in the, you know, the autumn or the summer, um, you have to wear like a hat and gloves and a scarf and maybe like multiple jackets. Um, yeah, I was pretty cold inside the tent when I was working on my bones. So just got to make sure you have the right gear to keep you comfortable, right? You also need to make sure that you have good boots, right? So sturdy shoes are really important. If you're walking up and down these big hills, you don't want to like fall over because you're in flip-flops, right? And the sand can get really hot. Like one year it got hot enough that my shoes and my other friend's shoes, the bottom of the sole that's like connected to the shoe, like the rubber part on the bottom actually unglued from the rest of the shoe. And so it was like flopping around and then hers literally came all the way off. And we had to have a friend come and bring us new ones from the United States when he came to visit us on the excavation. It was crazy. Yes, Ryan, I see your hands raised. What's up? Um, do they, put, do they like pour chemicals on th different chemicals on things to test what they are at first? Pour different chemicals mm -hmm. on what? Pour like chemicals and artifacts and things. Oh, um, 
so artifacts that probably go to museums, we don't do a whole lot of like chemical testing out in the field because it's just really hard to get all that material out there. But yeah. if they come back to like a museum or something, yeah, sometimes the conservators can like use different chemicals. I'm not a conservation or a conservator, so I'm not sure exactly what those chemicals are. But yeah, I'm sure they definitely use them, especially for like cleaning things off to make sure they can clean it but not injure anything, you know, that's painted potentially on the artifact. Um, yeah. But yeah, they definitely can use lots of different cool things to figure out what something's made of and, you know, what's drawn on it and what they use to paint and stuff. That's all. That's really cool stuff. All right. A couple other people with raised hands. See, so let's start with uh, Trina. Um, after you come home um, back to the United States, do you have to do like a quarantine after you get home? If like you're, say you went to Egypt and then you mm -hmm. came back, would you have to do a quarantine just in case? So in normal circumstances, when we didn't have like coronavirus going around, we don't usually have to quarantine just because Egypt isn't like that much different when it comes to just like the air and stuff. Um, it was like if we were exposed to something um, like a virus, then we probably would have to quarantine. So like if we were to go to Egypt right now and then come back, we definitely have to, but most times you wouldn't have to. It's not like a, a general every time we go thing, which is nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Vikram, you had your hand raised. So if the sand is so hot, then do you need, do you need any special, like, do you need any special boots so that the rubber doesn't go off like the first layer can go off but you can have a second layer it's there some boots that mm. you wear to, which uh, um which can cold up the sand so that like you can walk on the hot yeah. sand without <laughs> your foot breaking or the boot or the i boot. like the idea of shoes that like cool down your feet when you walk that's pretty awesome um sadly like those shoes don't exist or cool down the sand, that'd be cool too. Um, but oftentimes, I think just both of our shoes were on the older side when they kind of unpeeled. And so it's just, they were they were on their last leg and that was the final straw. Uh, Cause when we got the new ones, it didn't end up happening again and that was good. But uh, yeah, that was definitely like the only time I've ever seen that happen. That was kind of crazy. So I think it was kind of a fluke, but it was just but funny you can it happened have to both of layers, us. Right? Oh yeah, and then we have like socks and stuff on. It doesn't like burn your feet through it. It's just the sand is really hot for like the bottom of the shoes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Some more things we might need. You're welcome. Um, a trowel and a hand pick. These are important tools as some people were talking about. Um, these will be very useful and most times they're provided by whoever's running the dig, but sometimes it's nice to have your own too because you don't have to worry about like, you know, fighting over who gets to use the trowels if we don't have enough. Or, I mean, for me, I have a little trowel and I put a little notch and I carve a little mark into it every season that I use it. So I can remember like how many excavations I've been on. That's just fun, but you can't do that with like communal stuff. So it can be nice to have your own, but useful to have on the site. We also have brushes of all sizes and types that are needed to clear away dirt from mud brick walls or stones or to clean off small finds, like lots of little things that we find. Um, so that's why you have some like toothbrushes, but you don't wanna use those again to brush your teeth. Those are just for cleaning off stuff. Um, also, there are a ton of other tiny little tools that are important as well. You want like a little like Leatherman or like a little knife of some kind so you can cut through if there's like, I don't know, little branches or something. Or if you're just like, oh, I need some rope over here and you can just use that really quickly because it kind of stinks if you're sitting there with like a rock or something trying to cut it. That's no good. And then, um, yeah, definitely having something like a camera is going to be useful. I don't have a picture of a camera right here, but the camera took the picture of these things so we can infer it was also there. Um, yeah, we'll have rulers and uh, tiny little specialty travels and lots of rope and things to write with, all very important. And last but not least, you know, something to write on, like a notebook and a bag to put it all in because trying to carry all those things from one place to another in your hands would probably be like really hard and they'd slip up. So put them in a bag. Awesome, awesome. Yes, Emma, your hand's raised. Can you use a brush, like a paint like for your hair? brush? Oh, yeah, you wouldn't want to use one for your hair most likely, but paintbrush, yeah, we use those a lot, especially for like the tiny little things. It's nice and easy to kind of use the paintbrush to like brush a dirt really away from them. small one, like one that has the tip, like one that has a really small tip like this. Yeah, possibly. Depending on how tiny the thing is, we get some of these little beads that are made of faience, which is this like beautiful blue thing. 
Um, and they're super small. They're like a few centimeters big. And so using a really tiny little brush like that would definitely help to clean off something uh, like a bead. Yes, I see Vikram's hand is raised. So when you're doing an excavation, sometimes you need water, but can you also use it for the excavation? Because sometimes the stuff are like really hot and they're like very old. So when you're picking, when you touch it, you could get a um, like a, 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 a burn because this because the uh, thing is so hot. So sometimes can you bring water with you in the excavation from the bucket that you get so that you can cool it down and and if the thing is so high, then you could just take it out with the water. So luckily, one, when it comes to your bucket, that's just in a dig house. You don't have to worry about sharing that bucket of water with the dig site. We'll have water there as well. Secondly, when things are coming out of the ground, the soil underneath that top layer of sand, the top layer is pretty hot, but underneath it, once you start digging, it's actually much cooler. So when things are coming out of the ground, they don't have to worry about them being like too hot to burn you or anything. Um, we do sometimes have water to help clean things off if they're like really, really dirty and the dirt's like really dried and caked on. Um, but oftentimes, yeah, we'll just, you'll use like a little bit of water to soften it up and then clean it off. Good questions. Thanks. No problem. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to what it's like in the day a day in the life of an archaeologist. So, you know, obviously it's going to be very different depending on which excavation you're on and, you know, what your specialty is and what you do. But this is kind of like a typical day for what it's like to be at Tel Edfu, which is a site that I usually work at. So, first off, we wake up very early. There we go. And we have breakfast. So we might wake up at like 5.30 in the morning and then have some breakfast. And I'm not much of a morning person. So I usually will have like a little bit of Nutella and a cut up banana on some bread just to give me some energy and a little bit of tea to jumpstart my day with some caffeine. Next, we head to site and we usually arrive like at sunrise or just after. So again, very early mornings, very sleepy by the time we get there, but kind of waking up a little bit from that tea. Then we'll work for a few hours. So this is my friend Emily and I, and we're working in what we called the endless room because it went down for what seemed like, I think at least a couple of meters and which is like more than six feet. So imagine like a tall person, them standing there, that room went down six feet. We just kept digging and digging. We we're like, where is the floor? And finally we found it. So you'll dig for hours and hours looking for one little thing. I think that one actually took us a few days, like a lot of days. Um, but yeah, so work for a few more hours and then we have one of my favorite parts of the day, second breakfast. So I feel like a hobbit because I like love to eat when I'm in Egypt, but usually we'll have these like kind of like little street food sandwiches and maybe some fruit. Um, and then sometimes our awesome inspectors who are there, who are Egyptians who are hired or are part of like the antiquity service in Egypt, um, who are there to kind of like monitor things and make sure that we have what we need and that everything's going smoothly. And sometimes they would bring us these like delicious homemade meals. So this picture here just shows like, oh, such good food that they brought us, which was really, really nice. Then we go back to work for a couple more hours. Um, and then at about two o'clock, the workmen will go home. So we do not do this alone. It's not just like eight archaeologists, you know, from wherever who are coming to Egypt and excavating these huge areas. We have a bunch of workmen. We have local guys who just kind of like do day work for us um, and help us like carry a bunch of the big, you know, baskets which we call muktafs. Uh, they'll carry the muktafs full of dirt over to a different place so that we can move them away from where we're trying to like see and excavate. And then we also have specialists. And these guys are parts of are part of families or like close friends of families who have been trained since like the early 1900s uh, to be like really good excavators. So they can see like the tiniest little lines for mud brick and they'll see where like floors start and end if they're in like a millimeter thick. It's incredible. These guys are so good and that's why they're specialists and their specialty is digging. They're so good at it. So our guys are from Luxor. They're really great. And we really appreciate having them on the excavation. All right. so. We don't end when the workmen go home. We usually work for a few more hours. And when we stay on site to work, um, the sun's really hot usually at that point between like two and 4 p.m. So we do lots of like detail work. And so it's like sorting finds and processing them and putting them in our little database to make sure we have like notes of where they are and where they came from. And then we'll leave site around like 4 p.m. and then head back to the dig house where, guess what we do? More work. So yeah, really long days, 
Um, and we work so long because we're only in the country, like, or at the site, like we said, for maybe like six weeks or a couple of months, right? So we got to get as much work as we can done before we end up leaving Egypt and then we don't get to collect any more data. So very long days, but it's worth it because it's really cool stuff. Okay, did anyone have any other questions? All right, Trina, I see your hands raised. Um, what's really cool is that I don't actually care what time I get up. Like whenever I wake up, I don't care what time it is. I always just wake up and I don't need to like, it's like super easy for me to wake up at any time. Literally you be a really good archeologist because I struggle. <laughs> <laughs> I see Charlie nodding his head. I feel the same way. Um, let's see. Uh, Trina, did you still have a question or comment? No, that was just a comment. Okay, great. Um, all right, Ryan, you, oh, nope, okay, looks like hands went away. All right, cool. So now we talked about kind of what a typical day is like. I wanted to tell you about some of my friends who do some really cool things that are very different from the stuff that I do. No, I still have a question. Oh, I okay, go ahead. Uh, why do people from other countries let you in? Why don't they just take the these people from their country? That's a really great question. So. Luckily, archaeology is very global, which is really nice. So we have to apply for something called permits. So we have to ask the Egyptian government, like, hey, we have an idea for a project that we want to do. Can you give us permission to come in and do that project? And if they're like, yes, this project sounds good, then you get the permissions to do it. And if they're like, hmm, I don't know, maybe you need to do some work, um, they'll make you go back and do some more work and more research and stuff before they let you come in and do it. So it's a very long process. It takes months to get permission. So a lot of times though, they want you to come in because they're also interested in learning whatever it is that you're excited to learn about. So, okay. yeah, no, that's a really great question though. All right. So let's tell you about some of my friends who are really cool. If this wants to work. Okay, great. So this is Emily. You've seen her in a couple of other pictures. Uh, her specialty is settlement archaeology. So this means that she excavates the houses and towns where ancient Egyptians lived. Uh, what she finds on excavations aren't things like mummies or golden statues, but what ordinary people would use in their everyday life, like pottery and stone tools and little objects like necklaces or toys or figurines, which is also really exciting to find. Um, so her work allows her to learn more about how ordinary ancient Egyptians lived and how their houses and towns were organized. So Emily says that working on an archaeological site is difficult. That we cannot deny. Um, it's physically demanding. We wake up really early and work outside under the sun all day for six days a week. It's true. We work six days a week and then we get one day for a weekend. Um, yeah, so it's hot, it's dusty, and most days nothing too exciting happens. However, some days we find really cool objects or we start understanding something totally new about the site we work on and it feels amazing. Also, She's met the most incredible people while in excavation from all over the world. She's worked hard and lived together for weeks at a time and you create a lot of special bonds. So now she has friends in places like Australia and Belgium, the Czech Republic and France, not just people that she's worked with in the United States, which is really cool. Okay, this guy is Oren Siegel. He's a recent PhD from the University of Chicago, whose research focuses on the architecture at Orinarti, which is an ancient Egyptian fortress that was built on an island near the Nile Second Cataract, which is in modern day Sudan. So long, long time ago, the ancient Egyptians, their power and like their control extended all the way down the Nile, I guess up the Nile technically, um, into Sudan, where modern day Sudan is, which is pretty amazing. So Orinarti is very remote. Uh, so he actually camps in tents rather than in a hotel. So he has to, you know, maybe have that bucket thing going on. Oren says that surviving or the surviving architecture of the fortress is beautiful in any light. Let me show you some cool pictures of that. Yeah. Um, and the sunsets are gorgeous. There are also all kinds of animals from scorpions, which are not so fun, to large monitor lizards and all kinds of birds. They even saw a group of flamingos once, but he wasn't fast enough to get his camera out in time to catch pictures of them. Uh, one day there was a mild sandstorm. Uh, and as you can see in that bottom middle picture, visibility decreased dramatically and they all had to take shelter in their tents for the rest of that afternoon and part of the next day. And all of his stuff was just covered in sand because obviously like a tent's not going to keep sand out as well as a hotel, right? So another downside of tent living. 
<laughs> but the cool thing is he found like this cool, cool small find in his archaeological career, like his favorite. And in this top right picture, it's part of a leather armband or bracer, which was used by um, like ancient archers. So they would use it as a way to not hit their arm when they were shooting arrows, which is really cool. And it's hard to find those because organic stuff like leather doesn't usually last that long in the archaeological record because it just decays and breaks down over time. So really cool that he found that. This is Dr. Natasha. Uh, she's another University of Chicago grad, and she's an archaeologist and a ceramicist. So like I said earlier, ceramics is same thing as like pottery. Um, and she's worked in Egypt for almost 15 years. And so she specializes in pottery, uh, which is the most abundant type of artifact that we end up finding on an excavation. It's literally everywhere. In Egypt, there will be like areas where you'll walk out onto an archeological site and there's just like pottery, 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 pottery. So if anyone tries to tell you like, oh, the most common thing are tombs, like no, it's always pieces of pottery, which are called sherds, by the way, little pottery sherds. Um, Yes, so Tasha says that being a ceramicist requires a lot of organization. Uh, the pottery sherds are put in baskets by the archaeologists who excavate them. Uh, and then those baskets are sent to a large area called Tasha Town, which is this picture. And you can see she's just surrounded by pottery. And it's a small town for her thousands and thousands of broken and sometimes complete pots. Uh, so that's where she studies the pottery. And every year she picks a pot of the season. Um, and she takes a special photo with that year's winner. So on the left here is her with her favorite pot from that season. Sometimes she says that dogs come to visit, which is um, not great because the dogs love the pottery, but by love, she means they love to poop on the pottery and then pee on the plastic bags that hold all of her sherds. So kind of gross. Uh, and the life of an archeologist and ceramicist is really fun, but definitely not glamorous because sometimes you got to touch dog poop and that's grody. <laughs> Um, lastly, you can have a lot of fun when you're on excavation. So we can see Natasha is here. Um, she's actually visiting a different archaeological site with some friends. And one of her favorite things to do when she's there is to recreate temple wall scenes. So you can see in this one, uh, we have a picture at the mortuary temple um, at Medinet Habu. And you pretending to be Ramses III smiting his foreign enemies, which are played by two of her Edfu colleagues. So we have a lot of fun when we're out and about in Egypt. This is Erin. Erin is an Australian PhD graduate from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. He specializes in Nubian material culture, which often ends up being a lot of pots. So he is also a ceramicist, but from a different place, or ceramicist who studies stuff that ends up in the Egyptian record, but also comes from the Nubian culture as opposed to the Egyptian culture. Um, and he likes to study them from a technological perspective and a cultural perspective. So he wants to know what does the stuff that people made tell us about who they were and the world that they lived in. So in this picture, see you can see a fully intact Nubian pot, which is really amazing. Uh, and it contains an unexpected infant burial. So Aaron says it was amazing uh, the experience of removing from the ground something that he had spent so many years studying and had never expected to find. Um, basically, it went from being just another pot to when he turned it over, he found that there was the remains of an infant inside. And so it was actually used as a coffin because the baby was so small. They were like, well, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to make a, you know, a big coffin for the baby. So they actually used one of their like beautifully inscribed pots um, to bury the baby in. And then they just turn it upside down when it's full of dirt and then they bury it in the ground. So it was incredible because he'd been studying this for so long and then actually had a chance to, you know, excavate it himself and see it. Yes, Trina. What's an infant? Incense? An infant? Um, I think that's Oh, what infant. It. Yes, sorry, a baby. A very, very tiny baby. It's so like a super young baby. Oh. Yeah. Um, so he found a baby burial, which is really incredible to just find that after all these years. Um, let's see. So Aaron also told me about this experience excavating at the Pangrave Cemetery called HK-47, which is at a place called Hierakonpolis, uh, in 2017. And he says the surface of the cemetery was covered in these handprints that were left in the mud, presumably by the Pangrave people. It was quite a moment. I had just finished my PhD about these people, was in the midst of writing a book about it, and now I was literally touching the Pangrave person's hand. It was a very human connection and something that really stays with you. So you can see all these little like fingerprints in the mud there and he has his hand like on a handprint. So it's not just, you know, it's a nice connection to past people, right? It's not just something we read about and we talk about and we excavate, but it's, you know, people of the past are just really awesome. 
All right, this last picture, picture is also just a fun thing. It's of Aaron and I enjoying ourselves at the Edfu Temple. It was at the end of a long day. Actually, I think it might have been at the end of the season, and we were just like so excited that we did so much good work. And he says it reminds him that the work is fun and important, but it's also the people you meet and the memories that you make together that's so important. So let's move on to another friend. This is Ariel, and her specialty is epigraphy. She's an Egyptology grad student, and that basically her specialty in epigraphy means that she works with a team of artists and photographers to make exact drawings of ancient Egyptian inscriptions at Medina Habu, uh, which is a awesome site in Luxor, and at the tomb of the nobleman near the Valley of the Kings. Ariel says, I'm super lucky that I usually get to spend half the year in Luxor working in the field. There's no better way to start a day than a boat trip across the Nile. I also love that I get to be part of the conservation of ancient Egyptian history. There's so much material that gets lost every year, so being able to help preserve that is really satisfying. So Ariel's work is super important as well because it's kind of recording the things that people wrote about themselves, right? So it's like the autobiographies the Egyptians wrote for themselves on these temple and these tomb walls. And she's like, hey, what is it they're saying? What did they find that was so important about their lives that they wanted to make sure that people thousands of years would know about them, which is pretty cool. So here are some pictures of her working at Medina Habu Temple. And as you can see, um, if any of you were here with us last week and we talked about pets, um, a lot of dogs hang around Egypt and uh, she's taken one under her wing. So whenever she's at the temple, she'll like give it little scraps of food and now it just hangs out near her and like gives her kisses and stuff. It's very cute. All right, so this is Catherine, or Kat, and she's another PhD from the University of uh, Chicago who's worked at sites in Egypt as well as the Sudan. She specializes in philology, or that just means like the study of the structure and development of a language. And so she focuses on the Egyptian language in all different parts of the text. So the Egyptians didn't just have one language. They had a language that kind of evolved over time. So she can read texts in many of the ancient Egyptian languages, including Middle Egyptian and Hieratic and Demotic, and I don't even know which other ones, but I know she taught me Hieratic and that was kind of amazing. Um, so at Edfu, Kat was in charge of all the small finds and all the little artifacts that we found. And she also excavated and sorted and analyzed all of the ostraca from the site. And ostraca are just little potsherds or sometimes little pieces of stone uh, that the Egyptians used to write on. So they find all these little pieces of pots. They were like, oh, this is like little scrap paper. You know, if you just like need a sticky note for something, ostraca were basically just like fancy sticky notes for the ancient Egyptians. Not so sticky, but good for notes. She also excavated a burial in the Sudan, which is really cool. So Aaron found a cool little, you know, um, infant burial or baby burial at our site. And then um, Kat here was actually also doing, excavating some human remains in the Sudan. So again, just south of Egypt. So this is Olivier, also known as Ollie, and he's another archaeologist from Sydney, Australia. So we got to meet him and Aaron when they did some excavating with us, which was really fun. Um, his specialty as an archaeologist is understanding how tombs were built across different cemeteries from ancient Egypt and how they changed over 5,000 years of history. So this includes a lot of digging, taking lots of photos with a camera and surveying um, with a total station so he can better understand who the tombs belong to and why they were built within the cemeteries and different landscapes across Egypt. Currently, Ali is working as part of a team at the site of Jebelain uh, in Egypt with people from Egypt and Poland and Japan and New Zealand and Australia. So again, a really awesome like multicultural, you know, multi-regional group of people. And over there, they're looking for tombs that haven't been excavated for a really long time so they can understand them better. And Ollie told me how one day, because it was so incredibly hot and the days are really long, his friend took a nap in a cave, uh, but their cell phones didn't work. So they couldn't find him for like 30 minutes, almost an hour. Uh, they thought he got lost in the desert when he was like on his way to go do some measurements. Uh, but luckily they ended up finding him and he was just like, oh, it's good to see you guys. Where you been? And they were like, we've been looking for you. So probably not good to not tell your friends if you're going to take a nap in a cave in the deserts of Egypt. Um, <laughs> all right, last is me. As I mentioned earlier, my specialty is zooarchaeology, which means that I study animal bones for archaeological sites. And I do that to find out what people were eating and how they were using the animals, like were they using them for food or secondary products like you know, milk or honey, um, or if they were using them for labor, right? So I mostly look at domestic animals like sheep and pigs and goats and cattle. Um, so sometimes I find 
hippo bones, like this partial skull fragment on the left that I'm holding in that picture, um, or this baby hippo ankle bone. So we know we had adult hippos and baby hippos at our site, which is pretty awesome. But I also look for signs of burning or cut marks on the bones. So you can see on this little um, humerus fragment from a cow, your humerus is your upper arm right here where your big strong biceps are. At the bottom of it is where this came from. And there's these little cut marks along the edges showing that someone was trying to cut up this cow so they could eat it. So we know that this particular cow was being eaten, which is important. So on site, after the bones have been excavated, I have to clean them. There we go. And dry them like you see here. So this is just me showing off a, an afternoon's hard work. And then once they're clean, I can analyze them to try to better understand how the ancient people lived. So that's kind of my little setup um, at our storage facility where some of our bones were hiding out. All right, so now I have a question for you. Um, how do you become, or like what are some of the reasons you think why someone might want to become an archeologist? You can go ahead and put it in the chat to me or to Charlie. You see Trina, you've got your hand raised. So I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, when you guys, if you say you're really lucky and you like find any animal bones or any, um, or anything that you bring back to your site so you could study it, how do you bring it back without breaking the bones? So luckily they're, they're pretty hardy, but we put them into like smaller boxes and then we put them into baggies so we know where they came from and what context or like layer of sand they came out of. Um, and then we mark those baggies, we put those baggies into a box and then we carry that box to a place where we can study them. But usually we don't actually end up bringing anything out of Egypt. Different places have different rules, but Egypt says you're not allowed to take stuff out of the country, which is okay. So we tend to do all of our studying in the country. Does that answer your question? Awesome. All right, I see some answers here. Um, oh, you might go into archaeology because you love ancient history. Very true. And we'll see some of my friends who had that exact answer. Um, if you have a passion for discovering and uncovering artifacts, yes. Um, and if you love mythology, I know a lot of people who go into archaeology because you want to see how all these things connect. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I know some people might be thinking like, well, you want to dig for treasure, right? That's some really cool stuff. But no. You don't want to go into archaeology to dig for treasure. Is it a yes, Hi. Yeah, you want to go ahead and push? That's me. All right. It's okay if you don't want to. Uh, you can no, put it in the chat. No, no, I had a question. Um, okay. Uh, you said that like Egypt doesn't allow you to take stuff out of the country. So then, how do you uh, like? Not how did you get all the stuff like that's in the museums? out of the uh, yeah. country? That's a really good question. So a lot of stuff that is in museums now came from Egypt, uh, was taken out of Egypt many, many years ago. So I think in 1970s, I don't remember the exact date, um, they decided that they didn't want anything else to leave Egypt because so many really cool artifacts had already been taken out of Egypt, right? Like we have the Rosetta Stone, which is currently in the British Museum. And then we have the um, bust of Cleopatra, that is not Cleopatra, sorry, um, Nefertiti's bust, um, which is in the like German, the Berlin Museum. Um, so there's like a lot of really cool artifacts that already left Egypt before they put in this rule. And so now that they have the rule, we got to keep everything in Egypt, um, which is understandable because they obviously want to have some of their cultural history in their own country, right? Yes. yes. Ryan. Okay. Oh, wait, was that all? Or do you have another question? Uh, no, no, that was it. Okay, great. Yes, Ryan. You would you'd ask if you'd ask what they what why won't you become an archaeologist? Yeah. I was thinking, like, do they pay you? Or do you just yeah. do fun? Because that's fun. <laughs> so there is like volunteer archaeology that you can sign up for, which is really cool. Uh, but you do have to pay your own way. If you're doing archaeology with like an institution or like a, a college or university or um, some sort of institute like the Oriental Institute. Um, a lot of times like they will pay you because it's your job to do it. So yeah, you might go into it cause you're just like, I want to do archeology span and I want to get paid for it. That's fair. <laughs> okay. Nice. Let's see. Um, yeah. So someone who loves digging 
Exactly. So I think that there's no one way to become an archaeologist or one reason, I guess, that people become an archaeologist. There's lots of different reasons people get into it. But as my friends and I will tell you and show you, there are a lot of different paths that lead you there. Uh, but generally, it ends up being um, nerdy people like myself who don't mind getting a little bit dirty because you will get dirty on an archaeological excavation. It's just a fact of life. All right, so I won't go through these too in depth, but basically some of my friends here, you'll see like Emily and Oren, um, they, you know, did school projects on Egypt when they were younger and they just really had a passion for it. And then they decided in college, like, oh, these are really cool classes and they just loved it. And so they, they went for it. Ariel was similar. She always loved Egypt and she ended up studying abroad in college in Cairo, fell in love with the city and decided that like Egyptology was the way that she wanted to go. Ollie loved reading history books. So someone I think mentioned like ancient history. Um, so that's how he got into reading about the ancient Egyptians and he fell in love that way. My friend Aaron had a not so straightforward path. He, you know, when he was young, he'd like build sand pyramids and he tried to mummify meat in his bedroom underneath his bed without his mom knowing. And then she found it and got upset, understandably. Um, and so he actually got into fashion first uh, doing fashion design, but found it wasn't for him and then went into arts and then was like, oh, you know, I don't know if arts funding is for me either. And he kind of found Egyptology much later, but realized he loved it. And so that's how he got there. And then for me, you know, I grew up watching Indiana Jones movies and um, my dad showed me some slides from when he went to Italy on an excavation when he was in college. And I thought it was cool, but I didn't think too much of it at the time. And then I wanted to be an astrophysicist and a biomedical engineer. And then I wanted to be a pediatrician. Somewhere in there, I wanted to be a veterinarian. And then in college, I found archaeology classes, thought they were so cool, went on an excavation in Cyprus and just was like, I'm hooked. I love this. I got to do this. So it's not always the most straightforward class for people or, or not class, straightforward path for people. Um, but, you know, we all find our own way there in the end. So that's fun. OK, so we don't just work hard. We also play hard when we're out in the field. Right. So you saw some fun pictures of people doing silly things, excavation. Um, as you've seen in some of the other pictures, there are lots of stray dogs in Egypt, but sometimes they like to dig holes in our sites, which is no good. So we have to shoo them away, but sometimes they're just like really cute little puppies. So we get to like hold them and then carry them to different parts of the site. They don't make a mess, but they're really cute. So have some fun petting cute little stray dogs. Maybe don't, you know, I'm not recommending you do that. That's probably a terrible idea because they're full of fleas and stuff, but they're very cute and sometimes we do it. So some years we stay in Egypt really late into the holiday season. Like I said, we tend to go in the fall and I think that season we were there until like December 20th or 21st. So my friend Emily and I decided to have some holiday cheer and we put on Christmas music and made a Christmas tree out of palm fronds and decorated it with color paper ornament, colored paper ornaments. And we just had like such a blast. So try to make things fun no matter where we are and what time of the year it is. Snacks also really help. They're an, impart, an important part of a good excavation. Um, one year, Emily and I made sure to stock up on all of our favorites when we're in country. So lots of different types of chips, uh, like Pringles and chocolate, and then tons of Nutella. So there's probably like seven or eight little jars of Nutella on our snack bench there, which is very delicious, but also cavity inducing. So I do not suggest doing this. I think I came back with six cavities that year. So I, I learned an important lesson. <laughs> Um, we also did a Who Wore It Best a few years back. So we excavated this awesome large pot um, and it was likely used for storage and we did this fun little photo shoot. So who do you think uh, wore it best? Do you like it better as a giant necklace like Emily on the left? Or do you think it's funnier as an egg that's being laid by our <laughs> one of our head archeologists who's pretending to be a chicken laying eggs? My vote's for the eggs. I think it's so funny. <laughs> I, I think it's the egg. The egg, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty great. <laughs> and real quick, Martha, I think um, Jeremiah and Peter had a question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Uh, why did they worship cats? That's a really great question. So cats were an important part of like Egyptian everyday life. They were around kind of like we see the dogs are hanging around. There's lots of cats. And they probably saw how cats were really like elegant and, you know, they just kind of like glide around when they walk. Like, so they look very like regal, like, you know, like they could be royalty, right? And so I think it's probably just a matter that Egyptians saw the cats and they are really, you know, good hunters and whatnot. And so they ended up worshiping them because they figured they were probably connected to, you know, 
some kind of deity, some kind of God, because they were so like quick and they could see at night and they could run around really fast. So yeah, we don't, you know, we can't know exactly what they were thinking, but that's probably a good guess. <laughs> good question. Thanks guys. All right, I'll get to these last couple pictures real fast. So here we're just sitting on top of a car. We called her Big Bertha. She took us to and from sight and she was a really old car and you could just like, you couldn't hear anything when you were riding inside of it because there was no suspension. So everything you hit just made like a big rumbling noise, but it was really fun. So we had to take pictures with her. And then last but not least, they were the Nutella Wars of 2016. So we were really short on Nutella that season. And like I said, we all love Nutella when we're there. I don't really eat it when I'm home, but there, yes. Um, but anyway, someone bought this like local off brand called Quickie and it is not the same. It kind of tastes like burnt rubber with like a little bit of chocolate thrown in. It's not good. Um, but it was really funny to use as a prank. So we put the Quickie into an Nutella jar and then got our dig director to eat it secretly. And he was very unhappily surprised. So we spent the rest of the season waiting for him to get back at us. But luckily it was just a funny memory for all of us now. I'm still like a little worried that he might try to put Quickie in our Nutella next season. <laughs> okay, so last question I have for you guys. Why is archeology span important? We talked about a lot of the reasons why we got into archaeology today and what different people's specialties are, so what they're studying. But why do you think that archaeology is important? Why do we want to go and dig all these things up? You can either raise your hand or put it in the chat. Yes, Pia, Jeremiah, and Peter. Is that a raised hand or are you just making fun of us? You are to learn Learning things. Yeah, about, we want to, about what? About the life of the people. Yes, exactly. So we want to learn how the ancient people lived, right? Yeah, what were they doing all that time? <laughs> That's a great answer. Uh, Trina, what's your question, or your answer? Um, say you were going to Egypt and you had lots of snacks that, like, you were telling us about. Um, did they not allow some snacks? No, it's just that certain snacks aren't as easy to get there because they're not as popular as they are here. Um, so there are lots of, you know, different types of chips and different chip flavors that I've like never had in the United States, but they're like all over the place. So it's just a matter of preferences. Um, and so some of the snacks we're used to getting here, we weren't able to get as easily there. And just that year, for whatever reason, there wasn't a whole lot of Nutella. I think since it's been fine, but that was just the Nutella Wars of 2016. Yeah. Awesome. Ryan. Do you have something to, to add why archaeology is important? Because, uh, so we can learn about ancient cultures so that finally we can, like, go, so finally we can get the whole timeline from the Big Bang yeah. to, up till 2020. Awesome. Yeah. So learning about ancient cultures, we want to know, like someone said, like how they lived, what were they eating, what did they use as pots? You know, that's all like really good question or really good answers. And I think you're all right. Yeah, archaeology is important because it gives us a connection to the past, right? Yeah. And if we learn from the past, we can better learn for the future. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Charlie for our final thing. If you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat, okay? Thanks, Sasha. Um, so now, if you guys remember at the beginning, we had pen and paper and maybe some markers and we were drawing um, what we thought archaeologists looked like or what they did day to day. And now we're going to draw ourselves in, as an archaeologist. So some things that Sasha brought up um, to think about, like what your specialty would be. Uh, she's a zoo archaeologist. I think I would want to specialize in pottery. The pottery sounded really cool to me. So I think I'm gonna do that. And maybe I'll draw myself kind of like holding a pot. And yeah. And then some other things you can think about where you'd wanna work. Um, Sasha mentioned Cyprus, which is this little island in the Mediterranean. And I think that sounds really cool. I would love to live there. It was and, gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> so I think I will draw myself there. Maybe I'll draw some palm trees. Um, I imagine they have on the on surface. And finally, what tools you would want to have. So I remember at the beginning, um, we talked about the brush. We talked about um, like tiny shovels, a trowel. Somebody mentioned sifter. Um, and if while we're drawing, if you have any questions for Sasha, you can 
put them in the chat to her. Um, and yeah, just keep working on your drawing. And if you want, you can send us pictures of your drawing um, okay. to the OI, um, OI email. Um, but yeah, just kind of like think about that. And then we have some places as well. Uh, Pyramids of Giza, you could draw yourself there. You could draw yourself at the Parthenon, uh, Stonehenge in England. Um, yeah. But that's it for today's program. So thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, this is going to be the last one till, correct me if I'm wrong, Calgary until October. Is that right? Yes. So be on the lookout. We're going to be announcing new programs for fall soon. So probably around early October. Um, so a little bit of a break for September for the start of the school year. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.